Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number five for History 101, Summer 2020. And today what we're going to start covering is the material in chapter two on the British colonization of North America. So before we get to Brits actually landing and trying to establish colonies here, uh, we want to talk a little bit about why and when. Now, uh, the British were latecomers to North America. They're going to start considering the idea of colonization uh, in the second half of the 16th century or the 1500s. By that point, by 1550, Spain was firmly established in North America and expanding tremendously. And France was preparing to start to uh, think about colonizing the St. Lawrence River Valley. And as we talked about last class, we talked about by 1609, they are firmly established by Samuel de Champlain in the St. Lawrence River uh, Valley and had ventured down into Lake Champlain even. So, uh, the British were pretty cautious, but as they saw their competition, especially Spain, remember, one thing I want to keep emphasizing, this is all a big game of empire between the three top nations, Spain, France, and England. So the British kind of see themselves being left behind and falling way behind the Spanish, especially. So there's a lot of pressure being put on the British crown and parliament to do something about this. <clears throat> because remember, all three countries believe that they can be the greatest empire in the world and rule the world. Now, so... The queen at this time in British history is Queen Elizabeth I. Now, we're not going to cover a bunch of kings and queens in our class. I mean, the textbook will talk about some here and there. We only really are specifically concerned with one queen, Queen Elizabeth I, who started the colonization movement in uh, by Britain and was greatly responsible for it, as you'll find out. And then the last king before we become a free independent nation, who we'll be talking about later on, that's King George III. All the ones in between, we really don't care about them. This is American history. We don't even like kings and queens in America. And in fact, our Constitution prohibits the recognition of any titles of nobility. So a king and a queen, to us Americans, especially legally, are just other citizens visiting from another country. I know they're treated differently and so forth, but legally, they have no power whatsoever because we revolted against them. And when we revolted in 1775, we detested them, especially King George III. So <clears throat> if you want to learn about a bunch about kings and queens in England, and you're a history major, take British history uh, in upper level courses. And believe me, you'll learn more than you care to know about kings and queens. I know I did. So, <clears throat> back to the colonization movement. Queen, the first area that England, now England is really cautious. They always have been, always will be. So before they jump head over hills and go across the Atlantic to try to establish permanent colonies, <clears throat> they're going to experiment by colonizing Ireland. Now, I know that's not much of an adventure. It's in the British Isles. But... They wanted to see, because situations were similar. And let me explain for a second. Ireland was not an abandoned area. There were Irish living there, had lived there for centuries. And so you had a native population 
that had to be subdued, just like Native Americans in North America who had been living here uh, for tens of thousands of years, and they're going to have to be subdued if you're going to encroach upon their land and obviously take it from them. So, England figures if we can pull this off in Ireland, it'll be a piece of cake in North America. So, they start colonizing Ireland in the 1560s. And uh, initially, it's not going very well because the Irish basically are saying, who the hell invited you? We don't want to be colonized. We're perfectly happy without you. So British, uh, you know, colonization begins. Colonists start arriving. They're getting land grants from the British crown, and there's trouble with the Irish who are already living there. So Queen Elizabeth I knows this is make or break. If they fail in Ireland, it's going to be very difficult to get the British to commit to going across the Atlantic and trying to set up permanent colonies. So she's going to send one of her trusted knights because back in this day and age, you know, and still today, people get knighted by the crown. And the person that uh, she sends is Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who had been knighted. That's why he's a sir. If you've been knighted, you're known as sir, just like Two, you, two knights you might be familiar with are Sir Paul McCartney and Sir Elton John, knighted by the crown for their accomplishments, obviously, in British culture and music. So Sir Humphrey Gilbert's sent over there with extra military, and he's told by Queen Elizabeth, do whatever it takes, install order, this is make or break for the colonization movement. So Sir Humphrey Gilbert goes over there and rules with an iron fist. And he's very famous for setting up what becomes known as his lane of heads. If an Irishman resisted colonization, so let me just give you a, a practical example. Let's say you're an Irishman, you've been living on a farm that was your father's farm and your grandfather's farm. It's been inherited through the family. And all of a sudden, this British colonist shows up with a piece of paper that says half your farm is now his. So move over. Here I come. <clears throat> Obviously, you're not going to be very happy about that. If you resist this and try to boot the colonists off, become violent, do whatever, then you're going to deal with now the wrath of Sir Humphrey Gilbert. He would have these resistors arrested. The penalty was beheading. Then he would take your head and place it on a spike. And he had a really long walkway that led up to his headquarters in Ireland where the British governmental officials were all housed, including him. And there was this really long walkway. And if you were going to go to the British headquarters, <clears throat> you would have to walk up this walkway. And in the distance, you would see these uh, spikes in the ground. And some were empty as you passed them. But then as you got closer and you could recognize what was going on, on the top of these spikes are pikes, as they're known were the heads of Irishmen that Sir Humphrey Gilbert had beheaded. So let's think about this for a second. You're an Irishman and a British colonist has just showed up and said half the farm says. And you say, who says so? And he says, well, by orders of the Queen and Sir Humphrey Gilbert. So you go, you might decide, well, I'm going to go talk to this Sir Humphrey Gilbert and tell him this colonist does not get half my farm. So you go to the British headquarters, you start walking up to it, and all of a sudden you start noticing this gruesome lane of heads. Think you'll make it all the way through the lane of heads to the front door of the British headquarters? I highly doubt it because you don't want your head to be the next one on a pike on the lane of heads. 
He ruled with an iron fist. It was very brutal. But British colonization succeeded. So, uh, that's how the British were able to subdue the population. And that brutal treatment of the Irish is still resented by a lot of Irishmen to this day. And Ireland for a long time was at an unofficial state of war with England. Many of you may have studied or might even remember the Irish Republican Army used to use terrorist tactics against the British, set off bombs and subways and so forth, demanding their freedom uh, from England. Finally, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, a truce was reached, and it's been relative peace ever since. But from the days of Sir Humphrey Gilbert all the way to the 21st century, there was violence and resentment by the Irish towards the British for their uninvited colonization and takeover of Ireland. And it's even going to have an influence on early American politics, as we'll find out later on. Now, <clears throat> so after Sir Humphrey Gilbert's success, in 1578, he'll go back and report to the Queen and basically say, Your Highness, mission accomplished. Here's what I think we should do next. We need to get moving with this colonization of North America. So I request your permission to sail to North America to claim land for England so we can start the colonization of the New World, as it was known. So the Queen grants him permission. Sir Humphrey Gilbert and a small fleet sail across the Atlantic. They end up landing in present-day Newfoundland, which is located very near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Now, one thing that had already happened earlier than that, Jacques Cartier had sailed up the St. Lawrence, claimed all that area for the French, and that's going to be their center of operations in the near future. <clears throat> Sir Humphrey Gilbert gets in a little uh, boat, paddles to the shore from his main fleet, plants the British flag in Newfoundland, and claims it for England. Then his small fleet of ships turns around <clears throat> to sail back to report to Queen Elizabeth and report on what they had done. On the trip back, they're going to sail directly into a horrific storm on the North Atlantic. The boat carrier ship, excuse me, carrying Sir Humphrey Gilbert will be blown off course and sucked into the storm never to be seen again. Uh, one of his ships will limp back to harbor in England and report back to the Queen as to what had happened. First of all, they tell her, uh, for all intents and purposes, we believe Sir Humphrey B Gilbert's been lost at sea in this horrible storm. And then they explain to her, her sort of what Gilbert was going to tell her. They tell her that Sir Humphrey Gilbert claimed new, this newfound land or Newfoundland for the British. But they also told her, don't get too excited about colonization there. Already, sh fishing boats from all over Europe were starting to fish that northern coast of North America because the fishing grounds were so rich. And they report to her that they saw ships from all different European countries sailing around the area, so it's not a newfound land. People have been exploiting it for a while, apparently. <clears throat> so the queen sort of goes back to the drawing board. She mourns the death of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, her faithful servant, but then she has some further exploration done of the coast of North America, specifically the Mid-Atlantic, and an area that they're going to name after Queen Elizabeth. The area I'm referring to will become known as Virginia. 
The reason why they name it Virginia is Queen Elizabeth I's nickname is the Virgin Queen. So Virginia is named after her. Some pretty crude mapping is done of the coast of Virginia. And so the first real attempt at colonization in North America will start to take place in 1584. That's when, after this further exploration and mapping has been done by British explorers, uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert's half-brother, somebody you have no doubt heard of before, Sir Walter Raleigh, will approach the Queen and ask her permission to start a colony in this new mapped out area that will become known as Virginia in the honor of his lost half brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. And the queen of course agrees. And another reason why the queen agrees is it's really not gonna cost the British anything. Sir Humphrey Gilbert and a few of his friends are gonna finance the whole adventure. They're gonna send boat loads of young male colonists with some leadership. And what they're up to is they want to create a profit-making colony in North America. And here's what they're really up to. According to the reports of these explorers who explored the Virginia area and south into North Carolina, present day anyway, it wasn't known as that back then, uh, they believe that the climate reports indicate, because these explorers went in the middle of the summer, that citrus fruit could be grown in that region of North America. And what Sir Humphrey Gilbert and his uh, fellow investors envision is planning a lime growing colony in Virginia. And the reason why this is so attractive is the British Navy would, be, would buy every lime that Sir Walter Raleigh's colony could grow. And the reason why? Limes are a strategic supply to the British Navy. Back in this day and age, when sailors were at sea for months on end in navies, and if they didn't have a supply of citrus fruit on board the ship, they could get what's known as, uh, the word slips in my mind right now, uh, scurvy. Scurvy is a medical term for vitamin C deficiency. It makes you extremely ill and weak and worthless as, as a British sailor. So they needed supplies on board. The favorite of the British Navy, because it lasted a long time, if they kept it correctly, were limes. The limes that they were that were on British ships were mainly purchased from Spain, where there were a lot of citrus uh, groves. Problem is, you get into a war with Spain, first thing they're gonna do is cut you off from limes because they know it'll, it'll weaken your Navy. So, in fact, many of you may realize that a nickname for a British sailor back in this day and age was a limey, because their captains used to periodically get out a bunch of limes, cut them up, and they'd make the British sailors consume these limes, suck on them, and they got the name limey. So... This is what Sir Walter Raleigh's up to. He sends a small fleet in 1584, paid for by him and his investors, and they get blown off course. They're supposed to end up in the mapped out part of Virginia, but they've also had directions that they should take extra care and hide this colony away. They didn't want it right on the shore, Atlantic shore of what they're calling Virginia, because they were afraid if a conflict evolved with the Spanish, the Spanish were firmly entrenched 
in Florida and had a fortress at St. Augustine, they would come up and attack the British colonists. So they get blown to the south. They end up in present-day North Carolina. And to hide away the colony, they sail inside a geographic uh, location known as the Outer Banks of South Carolina, or excuse me, of North Carolina. If you've ever visited there, you know they're like a giant sandbar that's big enough to have small towns and so forth. It's where the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, which is on the Outer Banks, tested their airplane and so forth. You may have vacationed there before. So they're going to colonize on an island located inside the Outer Banks. And the name of that island is Roanoke. And this is the story of the Roanoke colony. So it started in 1584. And the way that it's supposed to work is the colonists at Roanoke, who are all young men with some leader, older leadership, they're supposed, they've got all the supplies and tools to start building a colony, building buildings, clearing land, and so forth. And then on a scheduled basis in the future, every few months, resupply ships are supposed to arrive from England that Sir Walter Raleigh and its investors will send with more colonists, more supplies, and so forth. So they get right to work starting to build their colony. They're waiting on the resupply ships to arrive, but they don't. The reason why is the resupply ships sail to the mapped out coast of Virginia, search up and down it, go up the rivers, and they can't find them because they've been blown off course to the south and they're in present day North Carolina. So the resupply ships are returning to England reporting we don't know what happened to them. In the meantime, the leader of uh, the Roanoke Colony is Sir Richard Greenville. Sir Richard Greenville, also knighted by the Queen, ends up almost destroying the first Roanoke Colony. And here's how it happens. He brings with him to the New World, as it's known, his most prized possession. He had this little commemorative cup made of solid silver that was engraved by the queen on the day he was knighted, and it commemor commemorated that historic day of his knighthood. It was his most prized possession. So as soon as he had a small uh, living quarters built, he displayed it proudly on his mantle over his fireplace. And anybody who ever uh, visited Sir Richard Greenville's home on Roanoke, he always had to show off his silver cup because he was so proud of it. Well, one morning, Greenville wakes up and his beloved silver cup is gone. He panics. He has the Roanoke Colony completely searched. No one can find the cup. So then he's thinking about it. Who could have stolen my cup? At this point in history, the Roanoke colonists were getting along pretty well with the Native Americans who lived in that area. And especially since the supply ships with additional food hadn't arrived, these Native Americans were teaching them how to farm corn, beans, and squash, uh, and assisting them with survival techniques down in uh, present-day North Carolina. <clears throat> Greenville remembers. A couple Indian chiefs had visited him on Roanoke. Of course, he showed him his beloved silver cup like they could care less about it. And now he's convinced it must have been those heathen savages who stole my cup. So he has an armed detachment go to the Indian village and demand return of the silver cup. When they won't return it, he has instructed them, do whatever it takes to find that cup. 
So they get violent, they ransack the village, search everywhere, and lo and behold, the native people were telling the truth. They didn't have a stupid cup. So what this will end up doing, though, is alienating all the tribes in the region. And they'll basically shun the new colonists because now they think these people are nuts. They accuse you of stealing something you know nothing about, get violent, just stay away from them. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, supply ships have not arrived. And it's been two long years. And the colonists are getting antsy, especially since they've been cut off from the Native Americans. Finally, Queen Elizabeth asks uh, another one of her faithful servants and a military man slash explorer, Sir Francis Drake, to see if he can find the Roanoke Colony. He was going on an adventure in the Caribbean where he was going to raid some Spanish colonial islands. And then on his trip back, he was instructed to see if he could find the colony. So on his way back, he sailed up the coast, the Atlantic coast from Florida northwards sailed inside the Outer Banks, and sure enough, there it is, Roanoke Island, right there where it's always been. <clears throat> so, he tells the Roanoke colonists, who are thrilled to see him, they think it's a resupply ship. He tells them, no, you've been lost, you're not in Virginia, you've sailed off course, I'm going to make a detailed map, and as soon as I get to England... I'll have resupply ships dispatched to supply you. <clears throat> the overwhelming majority of the colonists would have nothing to do with this. They hopped on their ships and followed Sir Francis Drake back to England. So the first Roanoke colony was a complete failure because the colonists sailed off course, alienated the Indians, and then got antsy and returned to England. So when they return, obviously the Queen and Sir Walter Raleigh are relieved that they weren't all lost at sea or whatever, or attacked by the Spanish. So Sir Walter Raleigh says, we're gonna give it a second try. I'm gonna pick new leadership. Some of the original colonists are willing to return, and we're gonna go back and make this thing a go. So uh, the next year, in 1587, uh, the second wave of Roanoke colonists will arrive on Roanoke, and they follow Sir Francis Drake's map, which takes them right there, which is a relief to them because that's the same map the future resupply ships will have. So they figure it's going to be easy to find us with this map. They get there and start back into uh, building the colony, and so forth. And then shortly thereafter, before any further resupply ships can reach them, a war breaks out between England and Spain. So the British government has to make a very tough decision. Do we take the chance of resupplying Roanoke? The Spanish are just down in Florida. They're going to be patrolling the coast, looking for us. They've heard we're there, and we're at war with them. They'll follow the resupply ship in and destroy the colony. So they make the hard decision of not resupplying. Unfortunately for the Roanoke colonists, the war lasts three long years. So they go without further resupply. Soon as the war is over, they dispatch a fleet of resupply ships to Roanoke. When they get there, they find an abandoned colony that's overgrown with weeds and so forth. It's apparent people have been gone for a period, time period here. They search around for evidence of what happened to these colonists. There's no evidence of violence. I mean, it doesn't, part of the colony's not destroyed. There's not skeletons laying all over the place. Uh, the only piece of evidence that they find is painted on a small wooden plaque nailed to a post on one of the buildings. And it has the word on it, Croatoan, spelled C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N. 
That's the name that the resupply ships figure out by uh, process of trial and error of an Indian tribe that lives out on the Outer Banks. And once they figure that out, they figure, aha, they must have went out onto the Outer Banks trying to flag in what they thought were lost resupply ships since they hadn't been resupplied. <coughs> they go and visit the Rono, or excuse me, the Croatuan Indians. The Croatuans report, yes, we know of the Rono colonists, but we haven't seen them in quite some time. We don't know what happened to them. So this creates what becomes known as the mystery of the Roanoke colony. Now, if you visit Roanoke Island, which is a, a national park today, and the areas surrounding it and so forth, uh, at the national park, they don't play this up, but I mean, it's a tourist area. It's the Outer Banks. This mystery is really played up. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of theories of what happened to the Roanoke colonists. Did they attempt to go back to England and their ships were lost at sea like Sir Humphrey Gilbert? Maybe. Did the Spanish find them, sneak in, capture them all, bring them down to the fort at St. Augustine and then execute them and not fess up to it later on when the war's over? Possible. Did they go inland where they had alienate Native, native tribes and ended up in a conflict and were killed in the woods of North Carolina. Could have happened. There's even theories that aliens came down, landed, and took them with them up into outer space. Now, I highly doubt that's probable, but I can't say for sure it didn't happen because I don't know if there's aliens or not, and no one does. So, what is the most logical explanation of what happened will not be uncovered until the 1970s. But really, it's 100 years later where the evidence is discovered but is sort of ignored and forgotten about. And the reason I know something about this is I studied... Uh, under a professor of colonial history at Eastern Michigan University, who as a graduate student at William and Mary, worked with a professor who was given this journal that somebody found in their attic that two British explorers about 100 years later in the 1680s uh, had kept while they were exploring what became the mountains of West Virginia. And they came across an Indian tribe that uh, had previously lived on the coast of Virginia. But they didn't, the name of this tribe is the Chesapeans. They lived in the northern part of Virginia near the Chesapeake Bay. They didn't like British settlers who came later. We'll be talking about Jamestown in, a, in the next lecture. Uh, and they moved to the Northwest and migrated and settled in the middle of nowhere, at the time anyway, in the mountains of West Virginia. Now, when these explorers contact, came in contact with this tribe 100 years after Roanoke, they were very surprised that this tribe spoke their native tongue and the Chesapeans also spoke perfect Elizabethan English, which was the British dialect of the time of 100 years previous during Queen Elizabeth. They had no explanation for it. They told the explorers, we've always been bilingual, spoke both these languages, and they didn't think much more about it. But later on, when scholars at William and Mary College came across this journal, they put two and two together. And here's the best logical explanation of what happened to these colonists. When the resupply ships didn't arrive, they knew the safest place to go and where they might be found is to the north in Virginia, certainly not to the south towards Spanish Florida. So they must have migrated up to the area where the Chesapeans were 100 years earlier on the northern coast of Virginia near the Chesapeake Bay. 
the Chesapeans took them in and treated them like members of their tribe, which Native American tribes would do pretty routinely if you agreed to live by their rules and laws and culture. And these people are starving to death, so of course they're going to. They're very happy to be treated like this. Then, as 100 years transpires, they're going to be part of the tribe, and the tribe moves to the mountains of West Virginia, but they remained a bilingual tribe. That's the most logical explanation of what happened to the lost Roanoke colony. But here we are. It's 1590, and Roanoke is a total failure because when the ships return and say, we can't find the colonists, that's when Sir Walter Raleigh and his investors pull the plug on Roanoke. They're not going for a third attempt. They, you know, as far as they're concerned, have thrown money down a black hole. Plus, by this point, they figured out lime trees don't survive in North Carolina. So, that's the end of today's lecture. When I pick up next, I'm going to talk to you about the first successful British colony in North America, Jamestown. So, uh, that's it for this lecture. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.